Hey CW Bio, Mr. Kennedy here with, you guessed it, part three of this video series on the origins of life on Earth from chapter 17 of your textbook. So the tail end of all of this, we we really just, we've, we've looked at how the Earth formed, we've looked at a trip through geologic time, so now we just kind of have to look at, well, how did life maybe get started here on this Earth and deal with two really important key terms biogenesis and spontaneous generation. So in the past, um, believe it or not, people actually believed that living things could come from non-living things. So like decaying meat could produce maggots or mud somehow magically birthed fish. Even people who stored grain in their homes in baskets thought that somehow mice or even rats could hatch out of grain. Um, their knowledge and understanding of the biological or scientific world like is super tiny compared to what you know, even though you haven't even finished this class. At the end of the day, the idea that fish can be born out of mud or decaying meat could somehow create life in the form of maggots, that's what spontaneous generation is all about. The term spontaneous generation is that the idea is the idea that non-living material can produce life. I mean, how crazy is that? It's like saying the chair you're sitting in could like, I don't know, decide to have a baby chair all by itself. No way. So there were a number of scientists that actually explored this uh, concept or this idea. And uh, I want to take you through briefly some of their experiments. We're going to start in 1668, you know, back when Mr. Kennedy was in high school, ah, uh, with an Italian physician named Francisco Reddy. Francisco Reddy disproved the commonly held belief that, um, well, maggots could somehow be born out of decaying meat. And he did so in a classic experiment that I want to make sure you understand and that you have in your notebook. In this classic experiment, um, Francisco Reddy took a, a handful of jars and equal sized chunks of meat and put them in the bottoms of all of these jars. A few of the jars he put burlap lids or caps on. Now, if you're not familiar with burlap, it's kind of like cotton gauze. So like you can pretty much see through it and definitely smell through it but there's a mesh on it that's small enough to keep flies from actually getting down through it to the meat. And then if you can imagine this, he left these jars just sitting out on the counter like days at a time, okay? And yeah, the meat rotted and spoiled and stunk, but, but, there's always one of those. There's a but. Um, there were no maggots in the jars that had the burlap like lids. Um, the maggots were covering the meat in the open jars, but the flies couldn't get to the meat in the closed jars. So guess where the maggots ended up? On the burlap lid, but not in the meat. So Reddy said, look, this proves that, you know, maggots don't come from this decaying meat. They come from these flies. Maggots are basically baby flies. So this put the idea of spontaneous generation for big things like flies and maybe even people at the time to bed once and for all. Like people are like, okay, I get it. But by the way, the meat's still spoiled and it's like growing this funky hair looking stuff on it that like, I don't know, looks really scary. So what's up with that? Well, two other scientists um, had to deal with that issue. You know, Reddy's work, it put put to bed the idea of spontaneous generation for big stuff, but it didn't put to bed the idea of spontaneous generation for little stuff. Um, people still thought that there was maybe like this magic vital force in the air that could somehow impart life to this rotting meat. And that's why the meat was getting all hairy and oozing and smelly and blech, right? So like off to the laboratory we go and a couple of new scientists. Their names are Spalzani and Needham. And unfortunately, I don't have a slide on them, but I do have a slide on the guy that ended the debate. Spalzani and Needham, well, they came before Louis Pasteur here in the mid-1800s. Um, Spalzani and Needham put beef broth in flasks, and they wanted to see, well, like, will that broth spoil over the course of a few days? 
one case it did and one case it did not. So that's why I didn't make a slide on Needham and Spallanzani because basically they didn't really solve anything. One guy kind of disproved what the other guy was saying, but really they didn't end the debate. This guy ended the debate. Louis Pasteur. In the mid-1800s, Louis Pasteur designed an experiment to disprove the spontaneous generation of little things, okay? Uh, bacteria, in this case, microorganisms. In his experiment, he, he designed a flask that we now refer to as a Pasteur flask, and it had this really long, you can see it there in the picture, curvy, crazy-looking, skinny neck to it, okay? And the idea was that, well, um, Pasteur was going to put beef broth, kind of like soup, in the bottom of this flask and then boil it for like 20 minutes to kill anything in it. And then all the steam would go out through this big, long, curvy neck. Then he'd sit the flask out on his counter, let it sit there for days, weeks, however long it took to see if the broth would then spoil. And he wasn't going to put a cork in it. He wasn't going to like melt the glass over the end to try to keep the air from entering. Because if he did, well, then that wouldn't do anything to disprove this vital force in the air. He wanted the air to actually be able to go all the way up the neck of that flask, touch the broth, and then work its way out. So no closure on the end of that neck. Now, because the neck was really long and curved, any air that was going to move into or out of this flask would have to go really, really slow, like almost as slow as the process of diffusion, like so slow that even the finest particles of lint, um, you know, or in this case, microorganisms couldn't be carried by the air. You know, fast moving air, I mean, it can do a lot of damage. I used to live in Texas. It'll pick your house up and you won't be in Kansas anymore, Toto. I mean, like, wow. So, but slow moving air, like it can't really carry much of anything. Slow moving air can't carry even the finest particles. So when the air entered this flask, it was going really, really slow. And all of the particles that it carried, if you look close at this picture, you can see this little brown dot right here that I'm circling. So yeah. So all the particles in the air like settled out right there. And um, and as it settled out right there, then that, that corner got really fuzzy and gross and nasty. But the broth never spoiled. Like, what? Like, what happened to this vital force that was supposed to somehow like, you know, impart life into the broth? Well, it wasn't there. What was causing broth to spoil wasn't a magic vital force in the air. It was whatever that yucky stuff was that settled out in the first little curvature of this long-necked flask. And to prove it, Pasteur took his flask, he laid it on its side so that the broth could come in contact with all that grossness, and then he stood the flask back up, and literally within a matter of hours, the flask had turned disgusting, okay? So proof beyond a shadow of a doubt, that there's no magic force in the air that like creates life, you know, it was bacteria, right? Now it's the 1800s. We don't know everything there is to know about bacteria yet, but at this point, we at least know that bacteria can cause your broth, broth to spoil and that's bad news for broth, okay? So Pasteur's experiment showed microorganisms do not simply arise from the broth, um, even in the presence of the air. His experiment put to bed once and for all the idea of spontaneous generation and gave us the world of biogenesis. Biogenesis literally defined or is the idea that living organisms have to come from other living organisms. Okay, It's the cornerstone of biology. Now, if you're a thinking person, you've got your thinking cap on, you might be asking this very simple question. Well, okay, Mr. Kennedy, if if living things have to come from all other living things, like if, like a cell has to come from a cell, well then like, where'd the first cell come from? I'm glad you asked, because we don't have an answer for that. <laughs> but we have an idea, which is coming your way next. Um, no one has yet proven scientifically how life on Earth began or where that first cell came from um, that maybe was bacteria or who knows what. Um, scientists have developed some theories about the origins of life on Earth, and they've been testing these things for decades, trying to, 
you know, answer that burning question of how did life start on this earth from a scientific standpoint? And simply put, ladies and gentlemen, like we haven't answered that question yet. We can't say for sure, yes, this is how it happened and watch me recreate it on a lab bench. No one can do that, okay? So at the end of the day, I'm going to share with you some of the hypotheses that scientists are testing. Scientists hypothesize that two developments had to occur before life could get started on Earth. So there must have been two events, if you will, that preceded life on Earth. The first is that simple organic molecules or molecules that contain carbon had to form. So somehow the atom of carbon had to show up on Earth and it had to start forming molecules then those molecules must have become organized into bigger and bigger molecules. Molecules like what we're familiar with from our unit on chemistry, our video on chemistry where I taught you about carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. In the 1930s, a Russian scientist, Alexander Oparin, hypothesized that life began in the like primordial soup of the ancient early Earth's oceans. Okay? And... Only after those other two things happened would this be possible. He suggested that energy from the sun, lightning, the earth's heat, all came together and triggered chemical processes in this like primordial ooze or this ancient ocean in the early earth that, um, that somehow sparked life. So basically... Rain probably washed molecules out of the atmosphere, right? And um, and those molecules came together in this primordial soup that was being heated and bombarded by lightning and radiation. And poof, according to Operon, life started. In 1953, two scientists, Stanley Miller and Harold Urey, tested Operon's hypothesis because Operon couldn't do it himself in 1930. Um, so they created an apparatus to simulate the ancient Earth's atmosphere to the best of their ability. They assume, remember, that the Earth is hot and that there's a few organic compounds and inorganic compounds floating around in the air by random chance. Things like hydrogen and methane and ammonia um, are present in the atmosphere, and they assume that there's water right? Because remember we said somewhere, I don't know, around, you know, four billion years ago, it started to rain. So they boil water and they introduce some hydrogen, methane, and ammonia gas. That goes through this little, you know, plumbing system that you see here, and it gets shocked by an electrode attached to like a car battery, which is supposed to simulate lightning. So the heat from the boiling water um, the mixture of these chemicals and then like an electric shock um, was supposed to spark the formation of molecules that led to life, like the first cells. So they let this thing run and they tried again and again and again and again, but they were never able to produce a cell. All they could produce were solutions of organic compounds, but no cells. So where did we get cells? Well, the next step in the origins of life that was proposed was a cell had to form, but that like was something that we couldn't recreate in a laboratory. In the 1950s, various experiments were performed that showed, you know, if amino acids were heated without oxygen, they could link to form proteins and similar processes could produce ATP and nucleic acids, but no cells, okay? It wasn't until 1992 with the work of biochemist Sidney Fox that we started to see a, a possible way cells could form. Fox introduced um, protocells, or excuse me, produced protocells by heating solutions of amino acids. So basically, he took amino acids and boiled them, and when they made the little bubbles, like, you know, it kind of formed a cell. Um, a protocell is a large ordered structure enclosed by a membrane and it can carry out some life functions because you know inside this bubble if you trapped just the right combination of proteins like maybe those proteins could do a chemical reaction or two like one of the proteins is a fuel molecule one's an enzyme and bada bing bada boom there you go but is it a functioning cell does it can it carry on life all by itself absolutely not
Okay, so it's 1992 and we still can't create cells in a laboratory reliably. So at the end of the day, like we don't have an answer for how life got started. The whole point of all of this is, is these are hypotheses that scientists have tested. Scientists believe or they think that about 3.4 billion years ago, like cells somehow formed, but they don't know, they don't know um, exactly how. Okay, so fossils do indicate about 3.4 billion years ago, there were photosynthetic prokaryotic cells. Um, but, you know, even scientists will tell you that they don't think that these were the first cells. The first cells, well, the first forms of life, they, they may have been prokaryotic. Um, they may have evolved from a protocell. Like, we just don't know. The Earth's Early atmosphere lacked oxygen, so scientists have proposed that these organisms were most likely anaerobic. And for food, those prokaryotes probably used some of the organic molecules that were floating around in the ancient oceans with them, so they'd eat that stuff, okay? Over time, as food became scarce, well, the, the theory is that these early cells that used to eat chemicals floating around in the ocean, well, they probably had to turn to cannibalism to avoid starvation. Um, so, you know, over time, the heterotrophs used up their food supply. And then, you know, some organisms that are floating around in here were heterotrophic, eating chemicals and potentially other organisms. And some organisms were maybe photosynthesizing. So we entered this idea of like, how do we go to get like a true compartmentalized cell with like a nucleus and a mitochondria and all that? Well, the thought is organisms that could make food um, had probably evolved by the time food was gone. So the first autotrophs were probably similar to present day archaea bacteria that we see in like thermal pools in places like Yellowstone National Park. The earliest autotrophs probably made glucose by chemosynthesis. In chemosynthesis, well, instead of using the sun, they use chemicals to make their own food, right? So autotrophs, they release energy in the form of inorganic compounds, such as sulfur, in their environment to make food. Um, photosynthesis couldn't happen until, like, the skies cleared up. Like, you got to have sunlight for photosynthesis. So photosynthesizing prokaryotes may have been the next type of organism to evolve after the chemosynthesizing organisms. As the first photosynthesizing organisms, well, not only are you going to need sunlight to photosynthesize, but um, carbon dioxide, stuff like that. And as a byproduct, you're going to produce, you're going to produce oxygen. So we start to get an oxygen rich atmosphere for aerobic organisms on land. The presence of oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere probably affected life on Earth in another important way. Um, the sun's rays would have converted much of the oxygen into ozone, and that would have formed what we now call the ozone layer to protect us from UV radiation. So that's pretty cool. Um, then comes eukaryotes. Like, So here's the deal. We've got some photosynthesizing cells. We've got some heterotrophic cells. Um, food is scarce if you're a heterotroph. So the thought is that one heterotroph probably swallowed a photosynthesizing cell at some point and noticed, hmm, this guy's making energy. So maybe instead of me digesting it, I should just hold it captive in my body and it will produce food for me or energy for me. Um, and that's kind of like the idea of the theory of endosymbiosis. The endosymbiont theory was proposed by American biologist Lynn Margulis in the early 1960s to try to explain how eukaryotic cells could have arisen, right? So that's the point. Like one cell swallows another cell, and instead of digesting it, it becomes captured in its body, like forever, okay? Um, some people call it the Pac-Man theory because it kind of looks like Pac-Man swallowing another cell. And then from there, the rest is history, ladies and gents. We go through the rest of geologic time, and one cell becomes a multicellular creature. Multicellular creatures, well, they go through their own changes over time. Some of them stay in the ocean. Some move out on land, right? All that stuff we talked about in the second video. Now, can we prove it? Not really. It's just what science thinks happened. Okay, so that's it, ladies and gents. This is... Uh, 
the long and the short of what scientists is currently science is currently working on to try to figure out how life got started on this planet. So I hope you've learned a lot. Um, I hope this was interesting and exciting for you. Um, this is the end of chapter 17. I'm Mr. Kennedy, and I will see you next time.